Ms. Ramon Akoman. I'm professor in political science here at the University of Bruxelles, Lipsel, and I'm delighted to chair this panel, which seeks to discuss some of the political implications of the judgments of the courts. Now, we understood from the previous panel that law is important, but I think politics matters to understand the process of adoption of this regulation. As the previous panelists emphasized, the court said that this is a duty, that there is a duty for uh, EU institutions to act. What can we expect now? Politics, I suppose, explains again some, uh, to some extent the non-application of the regulation since its entry into force uh, in uh, 2021, since the confirmation of its validity by the Court of Justice in February this year, and I would even say since the adoption of the guidelines uh, by the European Commission uh, at the beginning of March this month, and I would also add uh, since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, when we have seen, and it was addressed at the end of the last uh, of the previous panel, the Commission the Commission's attention has shifted to other policy areas, and this was also emphasized, I think, by Professor Repassi in the previous uh, panel. What is at stake, and what are the implications of the two judgments of the court? This is also the question at the core of this panel, and as I said at the beginning, the aim is to address uh, the political implication. Now, my aim as the chair is to provide a bit of context, uh, not to be too long, for some of the questions which, in my view, need to be addressed. And I would like just to emphasize two points. One is to remind that the political desirability and the legal feasibility of this policy tool has been or have been disputed more in some EU institutions and member states than in others. And as Julio Baqueros Cruz said in the previous panel, the conflict is not over. So this is something that I wanted to remind. And the second point is that not only the adoption of this regulation in terms of process and outcome, but also its non-application in the current context leave open a series of fundamental questions for EU integration. One is the decline of democracy. Uh, in the world and within EU member states, to the non-compliance with values, the values enshrined in the EU treaties and its consequence for le the legitimacy of the European Union, both within the EU and outside. Three, the role of courts, both national and European, in a context of democratic erosion. Four, the effectiveness of the policy tools, and we have heard in the previous panel again that this regulation is not the only tool, yet the question of the effectiveness of policy tools can, should be addressed. Tools which have been designed over the last years, which did not reach uh, the goals, either because of a lack of political will or because those instruments, as many political scientists have emphasized, were imperfect to begin with. And last but not least, another important topic which should be addressed is the transformation of power rela relations in the European Union, more specifically the growing role of the European Council in the day-to-day -day decision making, which as many colleagues that we call inter new intergovernmentalists said, so the European Council is instructing the Commission and the Council, raising also questions about the independence of the Commission and the role of the European Parliament in this process. So this ongoing transformation reminds us, probably or not, what the former German Chancellor said or called the method of the Union, implying that, the, implying by that, the constant search for consensus among member states and, I quote here, uh, the imperative to do everything possible to find a way to keep Europe together. So this, those are some of the questions that I would like to discuss with the members of the panel, and we are delighted to have five uh, speakers today, five guests, uh, who uh, would contribute to this conversation to discuss together about the political implications of the judgments. And I'm delighted to give first the floor to Professor Sabine Zorouguet, uh, Director of Sciences Po Grenoble, author of many articles and books in European studies, including titles on theories of EU integration, and also I mentioned here the book, The Court of Justice of the European Union. Professor Zauruger will talk about judicial accountability in the differentiated political system of the EU. Second, I will give the floor to Professor Olivier Costa, and this is a 
change in the order of the program. Professor Costab uh, teaches at Sciences Po Paris et Vipof, and he's also director of the Department of European Political and Governance Studies at the College of Europe. Also authors of numerous articles and books on the European Parliament, including the book, The EU, How Does it Really Work? So Olivier, probably you will say as how the Maybe. EU uh, uh, really works. Uh, then for the third part, uh, for the third uh, talk in this panel, I am delighted to welcome virtually, it is a pity, Professor Sadursky, uh, Charles Professor in Jurisprudence at the University of Sydney, author of the book, among many others, Poland's Constitutional Breakdown. Next to me, uh, Professor Carlos Closa Montero, Professor at the Instituto de Politicas y Bienes Públicos and EUI, author also of many books and articles on the rule of law, and I would mention here, reinforcing the rule of law oversight in the EU. And last but not least, at the end, uh, Professor Albert, Alberto Alemano, Jean-Marie Professor in European Law and Policy at uh, um, uh, the Haute Ecole uh, de Commerce Paris, uh, who will uh, talk about um, the external dimension of the union value. So, Without taking too much time for this introduction, I'm very pleased to give now the floor to Professor Sauger. Sabine, please, you have the floor and I'm happy to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ramona, and, and, and thank you so much for this invitation. I'm, I'm very, very happy to be with you all and I'm terribly sorry to be only remotely with you, uh, but I, I, I promise the next time um, I will make it to, uh, uh, to Brussels. So um, Ramona has already introduced uh, a, a very, very broad uh, uh, agenda <laughs> to, to which we have to, uh, with which we have to work today. So um, I will try to be uh, very specific uh, in, in, in my answers and uh, definitely will not answer all your super interesting questions. Uh, but focus, as you have already uh, mentioned, on one specific issue, which is the judicial accountability in the differentiated political system of the EU. Now, um, judicial accountability, and this seems certainly for uh, all of you a, a very strange way of answering the question about the role of the Court of Justice uh, uh, and its, its, its most recent uh, decision uh, uh, with regards to the rule of law. But I do believe that it's really important um, to take a step back and to uh, embed this decision in a broader context, in, in the context of judicial accountability in the EU, which is, of course, uh, a multi-level phenomenon. Uh, why? Because the Court of Justice um, uh, is linked to uh, not only the European level, but also to domestic level courts. It is therefore a quasi-federal phenomenon, uh, uh, which, which role it is uh, uh, to uh, assure uh, uh, compliance with supranational legislation. However, and this is, have, we have seen that in uh, Ramona Coman's uh, introduction, uh, the influence of the European Court uh, is uh, uh, encountered with increasing criticism. Policies resulting from litigation involve less public impact and accountability, and judicial activism is sometimes seen as a government by judges. And the question here is then, how far can unelected judges substitute their will for that of elected representatives? The question of judicial accountability with regard to the EU uh, and with regard to its judicial system um, has become more visible uh, due to two concurrent developments in particular. On the one hand, the increased judicialization of the European political system since the Treaty of Maastricht, and second, due to the increased differentiation of the European legal order. What does it mean, differentiation? And I know that many of you work on this uh, particular issue. There are a number of research projects on differentiated integration and differentiation. Differentiation uh, is supposed to accommodate the diverging preferences of national actors through flexible, integrative means. 
Uh, it's bending to the will of sovereign member states and accommodating the positions defended by national constitutional courts can be viewed as a way to strengthen the legitimacy and democratic foundations of the European Union. However, as we all know, uh, this also uh, this differentiation has also the potential to threaten the uniform application of the rule of law and consequently the democratic, democratic foundations of the EU because it increases diversity and potentially weakens the EU's normative system. So what do we mean really, and this is my first question, what do we mean by judicial accountability? Then, in my second section, I will try to answer the question what judicial accountability means in the EU in giving you a number of, of, of empirical examples before, at last, uh, um, I will come back to our uh, uh, the decision of the Court of Justice that interests us in particular. So, judicial accountability is very simple. It is making and holding judicial bodies to account. But this definition is already subject to controversies in the legal and political realm. Why? Because we have here a positivist legal perspective. And from this positivist legal perspective, judicial accountability is an oxymoron. Judges are only the mouth of the law and therefore to whom should they be accountable? However, uh, uh, judges take also decisions and are de facto legislators and uh, other scholars evaluate judges by the political impact of their decisions. And uh, what I will do now in, uh, in the second uh, 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 part is to um, uh, base my analysis on Capiletti's distinction between four types of judicial accountability. Capiletti's uh, uh, 1983 uh, article distinguishes between political accountability on the one hand, societal and public accountability on the other, legal accountability of the state and legal accountability of the judge. Now, when we look at judicial <laughs> accountability in the EU, uh, from a political uh, perspective, we see that we have a large number of studies uh, asking the question, how independent is the Court of Justice from member state or from institutional influence? We have here a very lively discussion going on, and it's still not uh, uh, solved entirely, between, on the one hand, scholars such as Karuba or Gable or Hankler, uh, uh, as well as Larson and Naurin, uh, who argue that there is a strong effect of member states' preferences on the decisions of the court. I'm not going into uh, uh, detail now, but this is their, their argument is really that the court uh, 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 is, is strongly leaning towards uh, uh, the, the, the major... Uh, uh, preferences of the of the major member states. On the other hand, uh, we have uh, Stone Sweet and Brunel's uh, uh, analysis, together with, uh, of course, a number of, of others, such as Karen Alters, um, who contradict Karuba uh, uh, and uh, his colleagues and show that legislative override is not a threat and that the court manages to circumvent its threats uh, 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 really, really well. With regard to societal accountability here, uh, uh, the debate is focusing on uh, uh, democratic or the democratic or the undemocratic nature of non majoritarian institutions <coughs> that I have already mentioned. These organizations are thought to be removed from public and electoral influence, such as agencies, but also courts. Higher courts are sometimes presented as institutions yielding a high amount of power and influence over a political system without being elected and hence not electoral, electorally accountable. And this is the debate uh, uh, that uh, Ramona Kuman's questions uh, that have been submitted uh, beforehand really trigger. And the question is, of course, uh, is there any way uh, to measure this non-accountability? 
Uh, in the U.S. context, we have really a, a, a large, uh, a large literature on uh, the responsiveness of the Supreme Court uh, to uh, uh, public opinion or uh, politics in general. In the European context, uh, the influence of extra legal factors is uh, definitely not that far researched. Uh, for a very simple reason, uh, that is that we usually do not really know uh, which judge uh, 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 had uh, defended which uh, particular position. However, we have research uh, that has been published by Blauberger and his colleagues, where um, uh, uh, he shows that the influence of a changing public debate on the CGU's jurisprudence in the field of EU citizenship uh, uh, was, was definitely something that he uh, and his colleagues could observe. Legal accountability, uh, let me go relatively quickly through the last two uh, types of accountability here. We have much clearer definitions of uh, the court's representativeness or the judge's representativeness. Uh, uh, the independence of uh, the judges, they must be independent from political parties and any other interests. And of course, their accountability. Judges, the judges of the European Court of Justice, must satisfy the requirements of uh, the treaty in order to be appointed. Now, what does it mean for differentiation and judicial accountability? Uh, uh, in, in our context. I think it's important to uh, uh, see that the increasing horizontal and vertical differentiation of EU law, starting with the open method of uh, <coughs> coordination uh, at the beginning of the 2000s, but also the increasing use of soft law and the challenges to the EU legal system, and now we're coming to our, uh, to our question, uh, uh, leads to a number of challenges for uh, uh, the court. What we see, and this for a very long period now, is a vertical differentiation uh, that is usually called constitutional pluralism. It refers to the problem of which a court, uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union, uh, or constitutional courts, get to decide where the EU's authority ends and the member state's authority begins. Of course, we think probably all of the German federal constitutional court, in particular with uh, both Solange rulings and the most recent 2020 Weiss judgment, um, where uh, the, the federal constitutional court declared uh, uh, that the courts, the, 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 the ECJ's uh, judgment was ultra virus, meaning that um, it went beyond its uh, competences in the public sector purchase program uh, decision. When we look at the horizontal differentiation, and now we're coming to uh, our uh, most recent judgment, the, the cases um, uh, probably you were talking about in, in, the earlier, uh, in the earlier panel, Hungary versus Parliament and Council and Poland versus Parliament and Council, the C-15621 uh, and C-15721 uh, uh, rulings. In this ruling, we see that the CGU upholds the legality of the regulation, uh, the 2020 regulation, in saying that it creates indeed a specific mechanism to ensure the proper management of the union's budget uh, in a context where a member state commits breaches of the rule of law, which jeopardizes the sound management of the EU funds or its financial interests. What is important now here uh, is that most commentators um, consider this judgment as a further step in the constitutionalization of EU law, and it is already considered to be a landmark ruling. At the same time, when you look at it from a differentiation perspective, while the ruling, you, you, you realize that while the ruling certainly insists on the importance of the rule of law in the internal workings of EU member states, it also creates an aspect of differentiation, which is linked to the content of, reg of the regulation uh, 2020 
itself. It is not any breach of the rule of law that triggers the conditionality mechanism, but only the absence of a certain rule of law, uh, which is the rule of law conditions to protect the EU budget at the domestic level, which are included explicitly in Article 2 of the regulation, but also those with, which are developed in the CGAU's case law. So, for me, it is really important to insist on the fact, and this is what the ruling does, um, that it's not a ruling about the rule of law in general. It is a ruling about a specific aspect of the rule of law, and it insists longly and uh, uh, very uh, uh, intensely uh, 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 on the fact that the Commission, uh, in every decision in this respect, must prove the genuine link between breaches of the rule of law and the sound financial management of the EU's budget. So to conclude, uh, because I was already very, very long, judicial accountability is a term that has multiple features to which the current differentiation really adds a paradox. Because on the one hand, as any other Supreme and Constitutional Court, the Court of Justice is supposed to decrease judicial differentiation in the EU political system through, and it did so through audacious legal, legal interpretations and social framing strategies, the collective interaction with the national legal and judicial communities. But at the same time, uh, we have a number of uh, rulings and decisions, and we have a number of actors that openly challenge uh, the Court of Justice in this, in this particular role of coordination and uh, harmonization. Uh, we have a court that, to a certain extent, does whatever it takes, uh, and I take it from, from Granger's uh, 2015 article, to foster European integration. It defers to intergovernmental solutions instead of supranational when integration is at stake. But it is clearly, since uh, uh, a couple of years, challenged through uh, more, more recent development, in particular the rule of law principle. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very, very much for your presentation. Uh, I'm very happy to give now the floor to Professor Olivier Costa, who will talk about the impact of the judgments on the political strategy of the European Parliament. Cher Olivier, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Ramona, and all my apologies for um, <clears throat> changing a bit the thing because uh, I made a mistake in my age and, and uh, yeah, I made a promise that I need to, um, to keep. So um, I wanted today to speak about the impact of the judgment on the strategy of the European Parliament regarding that story. And uh, we can say that the involvement of the European Parliament in, um, let's say, promoting European values or promoting the rule of law, human rights and democracy, and in a way calling uh, the EU or the EC at the time uh, as a polity based on values, this goes very far in, in the past of the institution. And this became really something central in the deliberation after 1979, when the European Parliament got directly elected and 410 MEPs find themselves with nothing to do because basically they had no legislative legislative power. And in the sequence be, be, be between 1979 and the Treaty of Maastricht, the EP has been super active in commenting on all those issues. Um, I would say uh, within the, Europe, the European community, but also outside. So the EP was a bit kind of a, a goalkeeper of uh, uh, um, democracy, human rights, and things like that, calling very much for the democratic legitimacy to do so. And, uh, and they even commented quite often on the situation in member states. Um, and they were criticized quite a lot uh, uh, for that. And in the, in the commission at that time, in the council, in the member states, uh, people were quite uh, critical with, um, with MEPs saying that they were irresponsible people, dreamers, demagogues, and maximalists, etc., etc., overlooking the sovereignty of member states and not being accountable for anything. And it's true that it was <clears throat> very easy for the European Parliament, and it is still. Uh, to, to some extent, uh, to be quite maximalist in the appreciation of those uh, things because they don't have to manage uh, the relation between the member states like it is the case uh, within the Council and the European Council. They don't have to manage concrete policies like, uh, like the Commission. 
and they can even look, overlook uh, EU law uh, in, in, in their resolution because basically there is no direct impact. So and no one is ever challenging a resolution by the European Parliament because it is just about taking uh, a staking uh, statement. Um, they have used all sorts of tools to, uh, to try to, to impose that uh, on the uh, European agenda. And uh, this was very much the case in international affairs. Uh, remember all the cases where the European Parliament has refused to ratify international agreement uh, with Russia, with Turkey, with Israel, uh, suspended some agreement or suspended the budgetary uh, aspect of agreement. And as soon as I got some some veto, let's say, they, they try to make some political use of that to impose the idea of conditionality on human rights and democracy in international affairs. But they also try to do that internally uh, regarding what was happening in member states. We can remember the very long sequence of resolution of the European Parliament, for instance, regarding conscientious uh, objectors in Greece. Uh, people were forced to go for military service even if they didn't want. Uh, when extreme right got uh, to power in a certain number of member states, also I remember some resolution about the behavior of police in France in the 90s when Charles Pasqua was the Ministry of, Inter of Internal Affairs. So there were only resolution. But very often those resolutions were creating strong reaction by national leaders who couldn't understand why the European Parliament was in involved in their internal affairs and commenting on that. So um, if you take that history and you consider Article 7, then you can imagine why it became such an important thing for the European Parliament to finally have a tool to be able to do something more concrete about some infringement of values or human rights or, or democratic values in the, in the member state. And the EP has been especially very active on the case of Poland and Hungary. I will not go here in the detail of all the resolutions that were adopted, two in 2016, one in 2017, and then the uh, uh, European Parliament has always been very active in supporting uh, the initiative taken by uh, the Commission to trigger Article 7 against, uh, against uh, Poland. The European Parliament has also sent uh, an ad hoc delegation uh, in September 2018 to inquire a bit about the situation uh, in, in Poland and then again ask uh, um, the Commission to trigger uh, Article 7. The same applies to Hungary and uh, between March 2011, uh, since March 2011, there were numerous uh, uh, resolutions of the European Parliament um, criticizing the lack of judicial independence, the lack of freedom of expression, the state of corruption, the problem of rights of minorities, situation of migrants and refugees, etc., etc. And again, September 2018, uh, the European Parliament uh, called the Council for Action uh, against um, uh, Hungary. The European Parliament has also taken a certain number of initiatives to, uh, to ask the Commission to create new tools to, to be able to safeguard um, uh, values and uh, state, uh, state of law um, in the member states, especially in October 2016. There was a recommendation to the Commission, the European Parliament, a call for the creation of the EU mechanism on democracy, the rule of law and fundamental rights, that's DRF, uh, and call that to, to establish that in the form of an interinstitutional uh, agreement. The Commission replied politely, saying that this was a good idea, but a bit more uh, complicated maybe than expected by uh, the European Parliament. And the European Parliament called again uh, to create such, uh, such a mechanism, especially for, uh, uh, for what uh, is linked to uh, budgetary matters and uh, to have that link between um, uh, the budget and uh, the respect of rule of law in, in, in member states. And then the file was uh, discussed by the, the Commission and later uh, the Council. Also, the European Parliament was very supportive to uh, the regulation on conditionality of December 2000, uh, 2020. For all that reason and for that history of four years of being so much involved in trying to, uh, to look at uh, the failures of member states or external members on human rights, democracy and so on, the European Parliament has been very vocal about the de facto suspension of uh, the regulation of December 2020 uh, as a result, let's say, of the compromise of the European Council of 10th and 11th December 2020 to avoid uh, Hungary and Poland to veto 
the, the budget and veto uh, the next generation EU uh, recovery, uh, recovery fund. And um, the European Parliament, again, had many debates on that and resolution and so on. And it went, as you know, until October 21, when the EP started an action uh, against the Commission over its failure to apply the regulation and for its attempt to play uh, for time. And, um, and this is quite, quite rare because the cases in which the, the European Parliament has used that sort of nuclear tool uh, are not very, uh, very uh, numerous. So the judgment uh, came, uh, was very much expected in the European Parliament and very much um, uh, commented. The European Parliament has taken very strong statement on that. Again, resolution, speeches by uh, the president and so on. And there are three main points that are underlined um, by the European Parliament in that, uh, in that story. The first point is to say EU legislation should be implemented regardless of electoral timetables time in member states. And the European Parliament does not buy the idea of the Commission to wait for this election or, or that one. Second point, uh, the European Parliament is calling the rule of low conditionality mechanism to cover also next generation EU funds. And uh, finally, um, the European Parliament has been very critical with the response of the Commission uh, to the um, court uh, ruling, call it, calling it inadequate and um, and yet again, criticizing that uh, political strategy, I would say, uh, of, the, um, of the Commission. Um, so now it's quite interesting because in a way, the European Parliament is happy to see that the court is sharing its views on what is going on uh, um, in some member states of, uh, uh, of the European Union, because the court has been very clear, saying that uh, EU is facing an autocratic crisis quite a, a, strong, a, a strong statement, something which is threatening the very survival of the European project. So uh, here there is some sort of meeting between the analysis of the court and the one of the European uh, Parliament. In the European Parliament, people expect the, court, the Commission not to be very courageous on uh, the use of the regulation. Uh, and everybody knows that uh, Hungary and Poland will uh, threaten the Council and the Commission to veto important decision, but the European Parliament has a view that uh, this should not be taken, uh, this should not be uh, taken into account. Um, if you look at the deliberation of the European Parliament on that story, it is really framed in a very large way, like, like some of, of the speakers did in the first part uh, of, this, of this conference. Um, because it's linked very much with that story of the EU becoming a power, uh, uh, which is very central to the uh, uh, French presidency of the Council and all the reflection, the current reflection, and what we had during the, uh, uh, the summit in, in Versailles. Um, and also that new situation created by the, the war in Ukraine, clearly the opposition between democratic and, uh, and non-democratic uh, uh, regime. Also, it is very much linked to all the possible uh, launch of another plan, uh, a financial plan to, uh, to fix uh, um, uh, the socioeconomic situation uh, at EU level. There are two questions, in fact, in the, in the debates of the European Parliament about uh, the judgment. Uh, and two questions that were, in a way, answered in the, in the right way, uh, uh, according to, to, to the EP. Uh, there is, first of all, the legal aspect. And the question here is something like, to what extent can we accept that member states ignore part of the treaty they have uh, ratified? And here, the, 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 the judgment of the court is very, is very clear about uh, the need for member states to comply with Article 2 uh, values, uh, not only entering the EU, but also after. So here, the uh, people in the European Parliament are very happy because they're supported in their analysis. And then there is a political aspect, and here also people in the European Parliament are quite happy uh, with, uh, uh, with the case, because the question is something like, is it possible to make the EU a real polity uh, with a pretension to be a power to get more involved in the defense and security with a mechanism of financial solidarity between uh, the component uh, of, that, of that block if those components don't share values if there is no common identity? Uh, and I think this is a really fundamental question because um, what the EU has been doing with that uh, next generation EU plan is quite, uh, is quite unique uh, um, uh, and uh, implies uh, to, to think also about uh, the identity of the EU uh, as, a, as a polity and, uh, um, and what links 
the, the, the elements of those politics, we consider that the EU will never be a nation and cannot be considered as a, um, as a people. And the court here is quite clear, saying clearly that the EU is not a cash machine and that EU law is not a, an a la carte menu. And uh, the court even goes beyond that and, and saying that uh, the EU must be uh, able to defend its shared values, which define its, uh, uh, its very identity. So uh, the, the case is making the link with that idea of uh, um, policies and, and values and at the end, uh, um, an identity. And uh, the court is also linking the rule of law and the notion of solidarity. This has been much discussed uh, this morning by giving a very clear definition of the rule of law and what solidarity is defined now as a fundamental principle of EU law, uh, which is implemented through the EU budget. So basically, people in the European Parliament are very happy uh, with um, uh, with the case, most of them are not lawyers, so maybe they have a reading which um, is less precise than some people have in in this uh, uh, in this uh, room. And uh, I guess that this gives, gives very good ground for the European Parliament to continue to uh, to harass the Commission uh, to to ask it to to use that. What is also interesting is the size of the majority within the European Parliament. The resolution that was voted uh, just after uh, the, the ruling was made, we had 478 votes in favor of that resolution. This is massive. We had 155 uh, uh, opposition, you can imagine who those persons are, and 29 abstention, uh, which, which, um, gives, uh, um, uh, which gives a sense of the, uh, the political struggle we, we, we have. Um, in some, we can... Um, we can uh, consider the, the, the current situation as three conflicting political views on the same issue. It is not a legal view and a political view. There are three different political views of the same, uh, uh, the same issue, the one by the Commission, the one by the European Council, and one uh, by the European Parliament. And in the middle of that, you have legal tools and some judges, which are a bit uh, trapped. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olivier. Uh, for the next presentation, Professor Sadowski will address this from a different angle, from the angle of the populist, uh, from domestic politics and uh, Polish populist political uh, politics and the judgment of the court. And a very interesting question that will be discussed is, will it compel Polish governments to comply with the EU values? So, Professor Sadowski, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and my very big thanks for the uh, invitation. It's a great honor to be here, uh, especially my thanks to Professor Ramona Coman. Uh, my apologies for not being able to be in person, but I need not only to promise, but also to warn you that I will come to Brussels, hopefully soon, and then and then I will claim my drinks, which I understand <laughs> will, be, will follow this session. Now, uh, I, I want to make five points. Uh, in my presentation, but before I do them, my answer to the question from my subtitle, just uh, recalled by Professor Coman, will it compel Polish government to comply with the EU values? A short answer is no, uh, but let me elaborate on it. So my first point is um, a question about what were or what have been reactions of Polish government, Polish major political forces and Polish public opinion to the judgments, especially to the Polish judgment, of course, of 16 February. And one very important thing to remember is that very few days after, on the 24th of February, something very important, very tragic happened, and it completely, but completely wiped out any possible concerns that Polish politicians and Polish general public could have had resulting from those judgments. So after some initial noises from the government right after 16th of February, and especially from the right wing, more extremist fraction uh, of the government, uh, represented and, and, and headed especially by the Minister of Justice, uh, that of course it's a violation of Polish sovereignty, that uh, Court of Justice acted ultra virus, et cetera, et cetera. 
it all became silenced by the invasion of Putin's Russia against Ukraine. Uh, to build a link with my predecessor, with Professor Costa, it may well be worth recalling that in the motion for resolution of the European Parliament, the uh, uh, recital N refers to the Ukrainian, to the invasion of Ukraine, saying, whereas the war unfolding in Ukraine has reminded us of our shared duty to effectively protect, protect democracy, the rule of law, and our values as enshrined in Article 2. Uh, the use of the invasion made by Polish government was directly opposite. And it was basically not now. Let's not talk about it now. To the point in which there has been a de facto censorship or silencing of any views saying that after all, the invasion does not supersede the breaches of the rule of law. Whoever tried to make such points was immediately dismissed, almost denounced as Putin's agent, as someone who would like to distract the attention from what really matters, and that is from the war. However, this type of silencing or censorship was very selective. Because while anyone who would like to remind about the breaches of the rule of law was immediately silenced, it has not prevented the government or the ruling agents from continuing to dismantle the rule of law and to do precisely the sort of things that the judgments at question oppose. Uh, President Duda, already after the invasion, kept illegally appointing so-called neo-judges to various positions as recommended by the legally composed National Council of Judiciary. More spectacularly, the so-called Constitutional Tribunal, so-called because improperly composed, has adopted the judgment to which I think Professor, uh, to, to which Julio, I think, in the first uh, session referred, basically for the second time declaring some aspects of Article 6, uh, especially those who have, which have to do with the uh, court being properly composed in order to guarantee impartiality, as unconstitutional. It has happened. So, you know, it's a bit rich for the government to at the same time keep on doing those things, but to anyone who reminds them of the obligations under EU law and EU values to immediately denounce as somehow uh, distracting the attention from what really matters. And therefore, it's completely disingenuous. That's my first point. The second point will be very brief, and I would like to refer to one of the questions raised, I understand, by the prospective audience. So Ramona has sent us a list of questions I think from the general public, but provided before the session. And there is an interesting question number three to our session. Uh, I quote, how can extreme right parties make use of a uh, court of justice judgment, such as in the Polish case, to reinforce their anti-EU stance? How can the judgment be used as opposition to the EU thus somehow making it weaker rather than stronger. So it is, of course, a question which, fairly enough, replicates the usual concern about the backlash. You know, these type of judgments will produce anti-EU backlash. But of course they will. I mean, whatever Court of Justice said uh, would be immediately denounced by the uh, anti-EU forces uh, as, as a proof of further violation of Polish sovereignty. But, you know, but whenever I hear this type of argument, I remind my audience that backlash occurs on both sides. And if the Court of Justice did not take this judgment, there would be backlash among the, and anger and resistance and resentment on the part of the pro-EU pro public opinion. And many, many of my colleagues and friends 
expected very, very sincerely that the judgment would be precisely like that. That is to dismiss the uh, challenges by Polish and Hungarian government. So we need to look at the two sides <clears throat> of the sort of backlash argument. My third point is the most important of all. And now I'm sort of, I will stop reporting what is going on in Poland and rather present my own views, my own reading of the political dimensions of these judgments. And I will focus, of course, on Polish judgment because that's my brief for this, uh, for this talk. Uh, and how it will affect all this argument about compliance with the EU values. So I, I hope that, or at least I expect that some of you will agree with me that probably legally speaking, the strongest part of the judgment, again, of the Polish judgment, is about Article 7 and sort of resisting an argument that the conditionality, quote unquote, circumvents Article 7. I think this argument is really very, very strong. However, my own worry, both as a scholar and as a citizen, is that the uh, Court of Justice here went too far in emphasizing, in my view, overemphasizing the linkage with the budget aspect to the detriment of the general violation of the rule of law judgment. That, you know, uh, to quote Hamlet, as, as Julio did in the first, uh, first part of this conference, uh, the lady protests too much. And they sort of <laughs> protest too much. So there are, there is a tension in my reading of the judgment between two aspects of the linkage. And I take it as a general preamble. It is not about the rule of law as such. It is about the budget. However, there are two readings mm -hmm. of the linkage. So there may be a, one reading which insists on extremely strict demonstration of a specific threat from particular breaches of the rule of law to sound financial management. And sometimes this linkage aspect is stressed almost to, in my view, absurd lengths. If you read paragraph 213 of the Polish judgment, you will see that the court says, uh, well, Article 7 allows the assessment of all serious and persistent breaches, etc. Whereas the contested regulation authorizes the examination of breaches of the principles of the rule of law mentioned in Article 2A of that regulation only insofar as there are reasonable grounds to consider that those breaches have budgetary implications. A very strong insistence. And it is reinforced by a point made in Article, uh, in, sorry, in paragraph 217. The point already mentioned by, by Professor Rebasti in the first session, where the code basically says, look, even if the breach of the rule of law continues, if the effect of this breach upon the budget discontinues, we will suspend the conditionality. That's exactly what they are saying. They say those measures I quote, may be lifted or varied not only where breaches of the principles of the rule of law in the member state in question have been remedied, at least in part, but in particular where those breaches, despite persisting, let me emphasize, despite persisting, no longer have an impact on the union budget, unquote. Why well, emphasizing it? You know, well, I mean, it really gives comfort to the, uh, to, to the, to the simmers in those states. But on the other hand, we have another approach in the same judgment, which I would call more of a per se approach, which suggests that it is violation of the rule of law per se, which necessarily has budgetary implication, which of course is a completely different reading of the judgment. So when you go back into paragraph 148, before this contrast with Article 7, 
of the judgment, you'll read, I quote, as recital 13 of the contested regulation states, there is a there is a clear relationship between, on the one hand, respect for the value of the rule of law, and on the other hand, the efficient implementation of the union budget, etc. No, that is a completely different reading. It, it suggests that, okay, it is still about the budget, but any violation of the rule of law will necessarily have budgetary implications. For instance, you can you can add to it. Because if judges are not independent, you can trust you cannot trust them in resolution of issues which also may uh, may be triggered by the budget issues. And then in article in paragraph 150, the uh, the court states in particular compliance with those conditions and objectives as elements of EU law cannot be fully guaranteed in the absence of effective judicial review designed to ensure compliance with EU law. The existence of such review by independent courts is of the essence of the rule of law. Now, again, it's a completely different approach. Now, Julio said very wisely in the first session, let's not read too much into the judgments. They are not, I, I will add, somehow written by an impartial rationality by some, some sort of perfect public reason. These are real people, <laughs> judges clear clerks, etc. you know, and they and different sections may be written by different persons, sort of drafted by different. However, this tension, the fact that the court is oscillating between the two readings makes me worried because mm -hmm. no doubt the first reading, the strong link, linkage re reading will be picked up happily by Poles, especially in contrast to Hungarians. They will not so say it in so many words, but then they will say, well, look, we don't have such a rampant corruption as Orban has in Hungary. You know, why, why uh, sort of throw this at us? Now, point number four, very briefly, will be well, I believe that Article 7 is probably the sort of the, the section of the judgment about Article 7 versus the regulation is probably the, legally speaking, the best uh, part of it. I believe that the weakest part of it, from my point of view, is when they consider the eighth complaint by the government, and that is about constitutional identity, but not identity of the EU, but national identity. It is surprising, to me at least, that the Court of Justice did not pick up this occasion to dismiss appeals to national identity as a shield against populist authoritarian actions and sort of convert it into a purely procedural, sort of boring discussion. You know, it's, it, it's a worry. Because obviously the are sorry. No, no. Okay, I, I'm about to end, so I, I'm about to finish. So I believe that this is an occasion which was lost, but it was a right point, right place to do it because the government of Poland, as is clear from the judgment, did use the Article Four to. Uh, appeal to constitutional identity, national identity, which is also in constitutional field, uh, in order to denounce uh, the regulation. And I don't know why they didn't pick it up. Maybe because it was seen to be too political. Maybe they didn't want to push the argument to the extreme, but I think they should have done it. And it sort of will be, I think, a source of a certain triumph for authoritarians to say, look, they they were speechless when we threw this national identity at them. And my last point, which will be very brief because it goes again to one of the questions asked in writing uh, to us, but also to the point mentioned several times in the first part of this session. And the question is, let, let me just read uh, from the, okay, from the, uh, question, question two. In the wake of those judgments, should we expect the European Parliament to start a push for further con conditionality instruments related to other EU values and principles beyond the rule of law? And my interest is less in the European Parliament, but in general, will 
can we see and expect the broadening of the conditionality under the values other than the rule of law? And my sense is no. And the reason is that the rule of law has a very, very special status, not in the sense that it's more important than democracy and human rights, but in the sense that insisting upon the rule of law creates lesser legitimacy problem for the EU institutions. And I don't think it has been often remarked, so I mentioned this point. Because when the EU institutions, whether the court or the commission or the council or the parliament says, look, you don't, you violate democracy, you violate human rights, then people like Orban can ask, but whose democracy, which democracy do you have? Why do you want to impose your liberal democracy upon us if in our constitution you have decided to have illiberal democracy, which is better than yours. You know, this is the sort of, you know, and, and immediately you have a head on clash between the author national authorities and the supranational authorities of the EU and the traditional legitimacy conundrum. But when the EU institutions tell member states, look, you breach the rule of law, the same question, the same response does not apply because to the que to the to the response, but whose rule of law uh, do you mean? The court or the commission can answer your rule of law. We want you to fulfill your own constitutional commitments because the rule of law basically means that your law, including your law as incorporating the treaty, will be properly respected by you. And in that sense, it, it, it has a different potential for raising the fundamental political issue about legitimacy of the EU institutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sarkisky. Now the floor is to Professor Carlos Cruz Amontero who will talk about non-compliance as a threat to the supranational structure of the EU. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ramona. Thank you also, Julio, and uh, the Institute for the invitation. And uh, I'm going to make a very short intervention because I, I really believe to, to respect rule of law, and that means respecting the rules, 11 minutes, which is the average that we're giving. So I'm going to, to rehearse a thesis that I'm thinking of, and I will be very rough in my presentation, meaning that you don't expect nuances from me, you expect a thick argument that can be challenged in a number of grounds. Now, I will start by saying what is the, the impact that we can expect from this ruling? in political terms, and I would say very little. I don't think it's going to change uh, much, or even I could say, I don't think it's going to change anything at all. I think that the impact will depend very much on the actors, how the actors receive this judgment, and particularly two of them. One of them is the commission, and there has been a number already, a number of criticisms on the position adopted by the commission. They're perhaps the, focusing on the unwillingness to act and what has been seen as a kind of appeasement position of the commission, which I don't think is totally wrong, but I don't think it's neither totally fair. But I'm not going to explore more uh, the commission position here. Um, the, Olivier mentioned before, the European Parliament is also pushing strongly the commission. What I think is more important is to focus on the role of the plaintiffs, the two governments that took, uh, that took the, the commission, uh, the, sorry, the, the European Union to court, the Hungarian police governments, which have been long in, involved in ongoing disputes on the rule of law. And my perception that I think many of you will share is that nothing is going to change in the behavior of those two governments in the future. And uh, Professor Sadurski already mentioned a number of instances in which they continue in the same kind of approach towards the European Union, have repeated in the past, challenging the authority and legitimacy of European Union institutions and uh, some of the actions and, and acts. Now, my thesis is that uh, the approach taken by both the Hungarian and Polish authorities, and I'm sorry for being so explicit, but I think we need to say it in that way. The approach taken by those two governments represents the deepest challenges, the deepest challenge to the European Union integrity that we face in the whole history of the, of the project. Not so much for the specific impact, but because it may impact really on the integrity of the legal system that we have in the European Union. I, it may impact on the integrity of the system because it's challenging one essential element there, which is the predisposition to comply with the law, 
something that is often uh, neglected. Let me elaborate a little bit uh, about that. Uh, we have said that the European Union has got uh, what has been called a supranational legal order, a supranational, supranational character, but Joseph Weiler, I think, is the one who captured best this idea of supranationalism, focusing on two specific issues. On the one hand, Weiler argued that uh, acceptance of the European Union legal order meant for closing a selective exit, meaning that you cannot derogate a specific uh, parts of European Union law. And I think Weiler was thinking very much on the confederal model of the United States in which uh, the unification debate in the early 19th century played a very important role, meaning that the states could nullify specific norms if they didn't feel that uh, they were uh, satisfying their own interests. Now, next to uh, this foreclosure of exit, selective exit, while I argue that there was an increase of voice of member states by granting them more power in decision making. And I think when, when some, of, uh, some of us were arguing the direction, for instance, Julio was pointing towards interrogators, we are seeing precisely this element, an increase of voice by member states because they not only uh, adopt consensual decision making despite of majority procedures, but also they control politically the commission. So how? there has been a huge debate on that. Now, this in any case represents an equilibrium system. You have exit, you have voice, and then you have even the possibility of uh, formally leaving the union, formalization of exit that you have seen with, with Brexit. What's going to be under question in this system is the third element, this a Hitchmanian uh, theory, the third element, which is loyalty. The whole system depending on a basic assumption. We are in a community of law, and the community of law is based on the willingness of the states to comply with the law. And that's a basic element of the, of the system. Now, it is true that if you look at the whole literature about compliance in the European Union, you will find plenty of authors that have said that no compliance is something that happens very often. So there are many instances of no compliance coming back even to the 80s, 90s, 2000s. Now, you can tell me, so what is so different in the Hungarian and Polish behavior of not complying with norms related to rule of law that makes this a qualitative different step. And here's when I want to introduce my, my notion about this defiant no compliance that comes to something closer to disloyalty. And this, no, this loyalty not in an ethical sense, but in a systemic sense. I think that non-compliance by Hungarian and Polish uh, authorities is qualitatively different because it embodies or it brings together four very different elements, not, not very different, four different elements that together may erode the integrity of the legal system. The first is the challenge to the authority of the European Commission as an enforcer of the European Union law, the notion of the guardian of the treaties. It's not so important that they challenge the law. It is important how they do this challenge. And the challenge has been often questioning the authority of the Commission to do that to the point that uh, those in charge of, of uh, guarding the treaties, the commissioner in charge of the portfolio of the rule of law, has been personally insulted. If you remember Vivian Redding or uh, Timmermans in time have reported how they have been personally attacked. And this is really the limit to the recognition of authority. You not even question the norm. You deny the individual the possibility to enforce the law, which is this very own very own. So the first element here is questioning the enforcer position of the Commission. Second element, not complying with the, UP, with the Court of Justice rulings. I don't need to remind you, this is an audience in which there are many lawyers, uh, that there is a lot of instances of disrespect for these uh, rulings. Uh, you may remember in the case of Hungary, the cases of uh, on the judges or immigration law, the case in, in the case of Poland about the forest or the, the coal-based power plant uh, in, in Turu. So there are quite a few instances in which these authorities have openly defied the rulings of the European Court of Justice. So this is a second element here. Third element, which comes next to that, and is very well known, questioning the position of the European Court of Justice as the supreme interpreter of European Union law, something that has been associated with other cases, but I think is qualitatively different in the way it's done in those two countries because it's linked to the whole set of other elements. And uh, by the way, here, I would say that you cannot compare certain cases because we're speaking about captured constitutional courts in the language coined by uh, Logan Petz and, and others. We are not speaking about the same species of constitutional courts. And I would refuse to put them together next to some other courts, like could be perhaps the 
um, the German the German keys. And here we have a very clear instance of what happens when you reload pluralism. That was a doctrine very much in vague in the early 2000s that has fortunately disappeared from the parlance. And I, I remember I, I, I debated with Miguel Maduro in around 2003 about his model of counterpuntual law in which he saw this heroic role for magistrates and judges establishing some kind of harmony between different orders. We have the opposite situation. This is pluralism at work, right? Four elements in this, uh, this defiant, four and last element in this defiant uh, non-compliance, which is, shouldn't be neglected, limited or curtailing the ability of national courts to launch preliminary, preliminary rulings. If we put together the limitation of the commission in launching infringement procedures next to the limitation to national courts to ask for preliminary references, what we have is, again, an erosion of the mechanism for enforcing European Union law. So you put together the four elements. What I'm saying is that no compliance from the point of view of the behavior of those two governments is qualitatively different to historical non-compliance. Historically, non-compliance happened because the specific costs and benefits, for instance, you implement a environmental directive, you may have some kind of cause or lack of capacity in certain countries. But in this case, we're speaking about a qualitatively different uh, situation. Now, what Weiler and everyone else assumed, talking about the, the European Union, supranational order, was uh, loyalty, the predisposition to comply with European Union law, even if punctuated by this kind of situation, which you have no compliance, which of course, is, uh, is not acceptable, but is not really something that's eroding the legal order. What we have now is a situation that will term disloyalty, the consideration that you can really dispose of the law as you may want and that you don't want to at all accept any other enforcement mechanism available in the system. So now you have a system which is composed of exit, voice, and disloyalty, which is highly dysfunctional. Now, I'm not saying that this is generalized. What I'm saying is if this generalizes, this is the end of the story for everyone. Right? Now, how can we expect the European Union to react? Because you can tell me this is a very negative, uh, a very negative uh, view, and it is a very negative view. What, what we have in the, in the toolkit of the, of the European Union has been said in the morning and has been repeated by the European Commission by some authors, among them myself, of course, I must say that, there are a number of instruments. But when you see the instruments and you come down, what are the enforcement mechanisms in those instruments? They come down to three things. A, persuasion. You can persuade the actor to behave, to comply. V, naming and shaming. The first one would be the European, Union, um, the, the European Commission framework for the rule of law. B, naming and shaming, the council dialogue. Third one, C, will be financial penalties. So at the end of the day, the whole system of enforcement, the last resort instrument is financial penalties. There is nothing more beyond that, nothing more. And here comes my, my final point, and perhaps the, the, the challenge I want to put here. We may think that this is a, this backsliding situation we have seen in, in, in those countries and in others is an end point, that we have reached the end of the process. But what if not? What if backsliding continues without an end? What if backsliding takes us to the position of arriving to an authoritarian or even semi-totalitarian state? What are the instruments available in Turkey to detain that process? We have seen that uh, financial penalties is the only thing we have there. But what if, if penalties had to be imposed to a large member state? Because we're speculating we can impose that to Hungary or perhaps to Poland, but what if we need to impose penalties to a large state? And I'm not naming anyone, but you may think of it. There was a discussion, in, even in, a early, in an early stage, but a discussion about how far we can go in that direction. My impression is that we don't have any useful instrument to enforce the compliance with European law in the situation. Now, that will end uh, the, the project. Hence, my proposal, if we are going to take very seriously the European Union, we need to reinforce enforcement mechanisms. And enforcement mechanism is not only in other penalties. We have to go perhaps in a bolder way, a bolder way that may require treaty changes. And I think that this is taking me to the, to the area of uh, science, uh, science fiction or what is unthinkable, <laughs> but those things have to be put on the table because we need to prepare for the unthinkable. In 2015, one would tell us, wouldn't believe that 
Brexit was possible, that Trump was possible, that a war in Europe was possible. We had all of that seven years later. What if we have a situation in which a country backslides to the point of becoming authoritarian? I think we need to introduce something to contain that. And my proposal is we need to revise the treaties. I know that this is basically unfeasible, but we need perhaps to consider the possibility of expulsion of member states from the European Union as a last resort instrument. Because that will act also as a kind of nuclear mechanism. The threat will make some governments behave or not. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Carlos Now, for the last presentation before the discussion with the audience, uh, we have Professor Alberto Alemano, who will talk about the external dimension of the union's values. So, Professor Alemano, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you can you can hear me well. Um, my apologies for not being with you in Brussels, uh, but today I had to travel back home and uh, my flight overlapped with uh, the first panel and, and, and the second one was also punctuated by, by a few breaks. So apologies if I won't necessarily make connections with things you might have been saying already or if there are repetitions. Um, I was asked by, by Julio to, to reflect on, on the external dimension of European values in the aftermath of, of the Russian invasion. So my comments are, and will be quite embryonic, uh, they are probably sketchy and might sound somehow naive or speculative to, to most of you. So I sympathize with Carlos' final uh, remarks. Uh, they are also incomplete insofar as the European response to the invasion is still unfolding, right? We don't have a, a European economic pa package uh, ready. It is under preparation. Um, we don't have a, a, a full military package either. There are actions already taken, but these are still unfolding and debated. Uh, the Versailles summit was not very conclusive on most of those issues, and humanitarian support is also unfolding, but uh, more measures could be uh, adopted, and we might expect uh, uh, the EU going beyond the coordination that has been uh, somehow provided by the uh, temporary uh, pro uh, protection directive, which has immediately been triggered by, by the Council. Um, so let me start by saying that uh, the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine uh, unveiled a, an inconvenient truth to, to the many. Uh, probably we belong to the few. We realized that before. The fact that the Russian invasion uh, showed to the West to the European Union, to its member states and the economic elite, the perils of trading uh, with adversaries or potential adversaries. As such, uh, this is somehow creating a, a clarifying moment for Europe, which may be consequential also on the way in which the European Union applies or fails to apply European values to its member states. Um, we can say uh, that the EU and its member states have, for most of the past few decades, uh, conducted normal economic relations with uh, autocratic countries such as Russia and China that abuse human rights, they endanger security, and, and this has been a deliberative, deliberate political choice that has been made, uh, that went through all the European institutions, uh, we were somehow aware. Um, we had probably less awareness that by doing so, we, had, we were engrossing uh, those countries, we were making them even more threatening because the richer they get, the more threatening they were becoming. Um, while this, uh, let's say, trade relations between the EU and autocratic regimes across the world already occurred during the Cold War, um, uh, when the West and the totalitarian Soviet bloc were, were trading, those trades was limited. If you think about it, it was mainly uh, energy, it was mainly grain, and there was a very limited level of interdependence existing between those markets. But as we have all noticed, this has changed over time. By expanding trade flows, we have established a closer interdependence also with those uh, countries. And today, I think it is, it is a fact, autocracies, autocracies are economically intertwined uh, with liberal societies. And instead of decoupling from them, we actually couple them uh, to us. Um, this Faustian uh, pact uh, was deliberately concluded and also strategically promoted by uh, one of the leading, if not the leading, uh, economic force, which is Germany, um, over the past governments that didn't hesitate to push the logic of free trade without any regard to the legal and political context in which those countries 
were actually developing. I would say a very similar logic was applied internally uh, with leading member states, notably Germany, accepting to turn a blind eye to rebellious countries to preserve their own financial interests. However, while the respect of European values by European member states um, uh, is somehow governed by a legal framework that we have been discussing and which has been uh, the subject of a major acceleration of the last few years and months, uh, uh, including the latest judgment, uh, we can say that uh, we don't have necessarily the same framework. So the question of whether the EU and how the EU is bound to European values in its external actions and omissions has essentially remained a blurred question and mainly uh, perceived as of political nature uh, over time. Uh, I'm going to say a few more words about this. There, there is a literature looking at this, but I think the big question is really the following. Can the European Union and its member states conduct a normal economic relations with autocratic countries such as Russia or China that abuse human rights and danger security? And as Olivier Costa reminded us, this has been the bread and butter question for the European Parliament, but not necessarily for the other institutions. Um, I think the, the, the question to, to be asked, uh, exposed, is to what extent that behavior uh, was compatible with European values? To what extent, when you look at the different policies, notably the trade policies, this kind of behavior should have not been questioned, not only by the European Parliament, by a variety of actors. But let me ask the broader question, which is to what extent European values do apply to European external dimension? I think it is undisputed that European values do apply uh, to the European Union. So this is an action. The EU is subject to a duty to promote, and this has been the emphasis in the past, and also uphold uh, foundational values uh, both within and beyond its borders. The EU is obliged to uphold and promote its values in its relation with the wider world, and these obligations are laid down in Articles 2, 3, 5, and 21 of the treaty. Over time, the EU has found different legal and political ways to promote its value externally. The policy instruments used by the EU uh, vary uh, in terms of format, objective, and enforcement. And I would say uh, the promoting aspect has been certainly be debated. Uh, this is something we have been following. And the enlargement policy has been the privileged area in which uh, the EU has been trying uh, to actually uh, do uh, its job, do its homework in, in this extension. But certainly the area of the common foreign security policy and its corollary, the common security and defense policy, uh, appear the weakest, the Cinderella uh, areas. And I think this raises today the question of whether and who could call on the European Union to verify the compatibility of its actions and omissions on its external dimension. So one of the questions I just start thinking about is, is whether the European Peace Facility, uh, which is a new off-budget fund designed to prevent conflicts, preserve peace, and strengthen international security, uh, is uh, compatible uh, with European two values. And who and how this assessment should actually be done and should actually be be conducted. Uh, there is an assumption that it is the case because the European Peace Facility uh, is aimed at preserving peace and protecting European citizens. But obviously, the, uh, the the context in which we have to make such an assessment is much more complex. Also, because uh, today it is difficult to define the nature of the conflict and therefore the involvement of the EU. Is this is the EU in at war today? Formally speaking, is not under public international law, but Certainly these, uh, if we take a broader uh, dimension, we consider actions which are today supported not only indirectly by the European Union, like the, the, the joint procurement of arms, but also the warfare that is happening in the, in the disinformation space where the EU is involved in either neutralizing or uh, perhaps even promoting messages uh, that are taking a stance in that hybrid war which is unfolding um, to, to us. Um, it is very blurred, the context we are we are assessing, um, but certainly we can uh, expect that uh, the 
so-called margin of discretion that the EU had in uh, somehow self-imposing itself, uh, the respect of those principles uh, will be questioned and might give rise to uh, disputes uh, that might be either of interinstitutional inter nature uh, and or brought by individuals uh, or other uh, actors in the coming uh, days, uh, weeks. Um, uh, when the European leaders uh, will be meeting again, um, the uh, discussion will go further in defining what will be the role in this conflict and uh, whether it will be clear uh, whether their involvement will be direct and direct and of what kind of nature uh, will it will it qualify so i think in the coming weeks hopefully days uh, we're going to see this discussion uh, probably uh, be prompted uh, or being uh, unfolded uh, by a variety of actors including uh, european civil society who might start asking questions that are um, definitely un unprecedented and uh, if we had a sense of them in previous let's say conflicts appearing at the border of the European Union, uh, they certainly didn't have the same scale, they didn't have the same uh, nature, and therefore we can expect uh, certainly um, an acceleration and a deepening of very those uh, questions. Thank you, I'm gonna stop here. Thank you very much for your presentation. Now, uh, I was not really a good chair in the sense that I was not able to keep the timing of the presentation, but the discussion was very, very interesting and the five presentations very complementary. So what I would propose now is that we collect both reactions from the members of the panel, if they want to comment on each other's presentations or views, but also maybe questions from first here in the room, and then we will take also questions from the audience. Uh, Professor Sadurski also had already addressed some of the questions that we have received in advance from the audience. So now the floor is open to comments, reactions, uh, questions. Here first or from the members of the panel, and then we will take also some questions from our very patient audience following us online. Hmm. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, okay, thank you. No, maybe this, a uh, uh, couple of uh, very, very big comments. Uh, one for uh, Professor Monteiro. Uh, Think about actors and maybe to mitigate a bit the pessimistic view. Um, I think it would be interesting to reflect on uh, the impact that other actors uh, may have in the dynamics we have analyzed. Uh, new actors that are now empowered by this uh, new instrument we're discussing today, the world for conditionality. Because if you look at the guidelines uh, that the uh, Commission has drafted, uh, there is clearly an opening or the possibility for individuals to submit complaints. And uh, it still has to be assessed to what extent we can consider that the power of discretion of the Commission under this regulation should be comparable or not with the discretion it enjoys under the treaty for infringement complaints. Hmm. So, from that point of view, a new uh, uh, dynamic can emerge, also because those actors will be probably free from the concerns concern at the states. Hmm. Either civil society addressing questions concerning corruption there in their country, or maybe also economic operators that uh, didn't manage to get the grants or the green programs uh, due to uh, non functioning of the system. And depending to what extent the Commission will undergo, this could introduce an, 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 another factor, uh, both from terms of enforcement, but also from the uh, narrative no, that is often portrayed in this debate, uh, union against Poland. Well, not, not exactly, because maybe there are, uh, Poland is not just Poland, it's just the government of Poland and the uh, uh, civil society that is now more empowered. And then, just to uh, to quick remark uh, on the boring part uh, referred to of the judgment by <laughs> Professor Sadowski. Well, yes, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I'm sorry. I think 
This is the, the, the boredom uh, uh, of the rule of law, of a law, of a union based uh, on the rule of law. And uh, uh, I have the impression that the court already has taken on this part uh, a strong position. Uh, it was not obliged to enter this debate of national identity. It was struck a bit into it by the argument made by Poland uh, and Hungary. Uh, I uh, really much appreciated the image that uh, Julio said. Yes, it was like really for you. Know, the guy that called there and they called me a statement. But I think that going beyond this, they're putting question uh, whether this was what the court needed to do to decide the case. Um, on Alemanno and the reference to Germany, I won't comment on the external dimension, but as for the internal dimension, well, this whole thing of the rule of conditionality starts from a German paper, a German idea back in 2017. So uh, I would say to be careful in, in addressing uh, the position of, of dominant countries, uh, Germany here was the main uh, political engine. And by the way, it was the alpha and the omega because at the end they conclude that the regulation was concluded under the German presidency and Germany was one of the member states intervening exactly because it was one of those uh, negotiating to the end instruments. And on Parliament, well, um, I think I don't have time to elaborate this here, but uh, because there's also a lot, there will be many things to say. Yeah. Thank you very much, Manuel Basti. There are already some questions here, but I propose that we collect all the other uh, comments and reactions uh, to the five uh, members of the panel. Julio, maybe you can join us here, or you can speak from there as you prefer. Maybe uh, it's easier from there. Yes, I think yeah, so. Yeah, it is easier yeah. for the participants to see you also. Yes. This is my telephone? No. It is a telephone. No, it's not my, not my. I think it's uh, not. No, I would have many, many things to say, but very quickly, eh, because the time is running. Eh, eh, eh. And just two points to Professor Sadursky. I think the, the court tediously elaborates this point to respond to the arguments of the applicants. Uh, the connection with the budget is not the court's invention. This is in the regulation. Eh? And I have to stress this act is an act of the legislature. And the, the main character in this story is the legislature, it's not the court. The court is a side character. Uh, the defendants in the case are the parliament and the council, which are the authors of the act. And so uh, I don't think a per se approach is possible. This is not possible under the regulation itself. It's not the, the judgment. I don't think the link is so strict as to render the regulation ineffective, because especially the court confirms that systemic breaches, widespread breaches, are covered. Whereas the European Council had said in the conclusions of December 2020 that they were excluded. And the court clearly says they are included systemic breaches. And the court also says, and, and risks are also included, not only impacts, but also risks, as long as there is a high probability. Now, what is a high probability of uh, an impact in terms of risk from a systemic breach? Not an individual breach in one particular case, but a systemic breach covering the action of a, 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 a general institutions, like the judiciary prosecution services in general, not one particular court or one particular prosecutor. So I think this leaves ample room for an effective application of the mechanism, even if a per se approach is not possible under the regulation. Again, it's not the court. And one small comment to Carlos. Eh? I think you have exit, voice, loyalty and disloyalty, but also another category which I would call control. And control is not the same as voice. Eh? Control in a, in a multilateral organization and to pretend that anything that is done has to be done with your uh, consent and that if you don't consent, nothing can be done. This is different from voice because what this does is to deny the autonomy of the organization. It's, it denies its existence as an organizational entity of its own. It becomes a sum of segments, yeah? So this, it's not the same. Voice is one thing, I think, it's influence 
in discussion. Control, absolute control, through veto, I think is, a, is something, something else. Are there other questions uh, in the room? I would also maybe want to ask a couple of questions. So we discussed in the previous panel that there are many instruments and we all know that uh, the, the outcomes and it was very difficult to reach some goals in those instruments. And now I would like to challenge Professor Cross uh, 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 about this proposal, which is to change the treaties, where it was very difficult to reach a majority in the Council for Article 7. It is just, I'm asking, I know it is a very difficult yeah. question, but it is uh, very, very challenging, I think. So this is one of my points. Uh, we see there that there is a treaty provision and there is no exit from Article 7. So I'm just asking that. And maybe just a reaction to what you said, um, Emmanuel, about 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 civil society and this part in the guidelines of the Commission, which are very nice synthesis between what is said in the regulation and what the court said about uh, in the two uh, judgments uh, about the fact that citizens should be more active in doing that. But here, my point is that uh, in some countries, civil society has been already very active and there is a feeling of fatigue. Uh, I'm referring here to the case of Poland. Uh, judges uh, mobilized and they expressed concerns and civil society, which is now under pressure, even in this context, with the Russian invasion, they are doing an amazing uh, job and role while the government was very, very strict uh, and uh, restricting the freedom of the space of civil society. So I think that's, yeah, it, it would be good to see civil society doing more, but I think that civil society already tried to do uh, some things and it was a kind of dissatisfaction because the answer should come at some point also from EU institutions. So. Yeah, we have this feeling that we talk about, you know, uh, the, the, the the game and the ball was in the uh, political camp, then it moved to uh, the Court of Justice, and now we are, the ball is again back in the realm of political parties, and now we talk about, again, civil society. So I think we are in a crucial dilemma, and I think here I'm joining uh, Carlos Crosal when he says that this is a real challenge for EU integration, and... Mm. The panel today shows that we have different views, but we don't really have answers to this, and probably the answer is still political. So I, this is just I want, what I wanted to say about, about this, is that uh, we probably um, are good in identifying the problems, but the solution should come from <laughs> elsewhere. So I don't know who wants to react, maybe from, uh, from uh, our members of the panel uh, uh, following us from I suppose Paris and New York, or here in the room. Who wants to go first, uh, Sabine? Thank you. Um, a very, very quick reaction. I, I found the uh, discussion uh, extremely interesting and relevant. Uh, what what I take from from our debate is that um, we have a a very, very high expectation with regard to the Court of Justice. And we, we, we seemingly um, uh, uh, think that the Court of Justice can solve a large number of problems, which is certainly due also to our reading of the Court of Justice as, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the institution that, um, that allows uh, uh, the creation of unity um, and the definition, of course, of a Supreme Court is to create a uh, harmonization of, 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 of uh, application of or the application of EU law. But the, the, the difficulty we have and, and have, we, we always have with um, courts is that courts cannot do everything. Um, and what I have tried to show in my uh, in my presentation is um, uh, that the court is is certainly a legal actor, but it's also a political actor, um, and it, we cannot expect uh, that it always does what we expect the court that should the court that the court should do. Um, uh, and I I do believe, and here I would definitely side with uh, 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 Carlos' uh, uh, idea that uh, the answer might be or must be political in the future. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, our rely reliance on the court might come to an end, uh, given that the EU is a differentiated 
increasingly differentiated political order. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Sabine. Uh, Professor Sadurski or Professor Aleman or Professor Klosa? I don't know in which order. Yeah. Yes, please. Microphone. With the microphone, with the microphone, please. The most frequently used phrase in 2021 and now 2022, and it is, I believe, statistically proved, is unmute. Or please unmute. <laughs> <laughs> So I have already unmuted. Just two points uh, to the specific uh, comments addressed to me. To Professor Rebasti, and with my apologies, I, I didn't hear you very, very well, but I understood that it was about my explanation or my attempt of explanation about why rule of law conditionality is different from other Article 2 values conditionality. Uh, I still would like to insist that there is some reason why, for example, we didn't we did have rule of law framework, but we didn't have democracy framework or human rights framework or non-discrimination framework. After all, we have initiated by the parliament uh, rule of law framework against Orban, but According to many analysts, the breaches of democracy in Hungary are much more blatant and scandalous than breaches of, of law. He has more or less subjected judges to himself. You know, he has a new constitution. But at the same time, when it comes to the mechanisms of democracy, the whole system, electoral system, gerrymandering, constitu constituency of voters, etc., has been completely, completely deforming. And I think there must be reason for why the rule of law is so much such a preferred value as, a, as opposed to those other values in Article 2. And I believe that for reasons I suggested, it is le much less conducible to the fundamental legitimacy problem. But now going back to my dear friend Julio, uh, I respectfully, as they say, very respectfully disagree. So you are making two points, as I, I, I take it, in response to my analysis of this oscillational tension within the judgment, within the Polish judgment. Uh, one point is, look, it is, if you have this objection, this objection against the regulation that is against the lawmaker rather than against the court. Well, but you know very well. Uh, and few people probably know it better than you do, that the court can add a very important value or disvalue to legislation by its interpretation. So I think that there is some fundamental problem in the interpretation supplied to us by the court, which sort of oscillates between these two readings. And the second point you are making is to somehow rephrase my distinction between what I rather ineptly called a per se approach versus uh, versus uh, what I call the strict linkage approach into systemic versus individual. Now, these are not exactly the same thing. Both systemic and individual breaches of the rule of law may be uh, manifested either in the general per se approach by saying either systemic or individual breach of law in itself constitutes harm to the budget and sound financial management, or we may use both these things in a way which, uh, which requires a proof, an individual proof that this particular breach or the general systemic breach actually has negative impact upon the budget. So if you prefer, I can replace it by a slightly different terminology, and I can say that what I call this per se is more of a justificatory approach. That is, how do we justify uh, the breach, uh, the sort of policing of the breach of law? We justify it by, for the purpose of by its impact upon the budget. And another is evidentiary approach. That is, you have to provide evidence that a particular uh, breach of the rule of law has no impact on 
you know, that some of its impacts, I don't know, on contracts, on divorce, on whatever, you know, it's still breach of the rule of law, but it has no specific impact upon the budget. You know. So just to finish, I produced two paragraphs of the Polish judgment, which I believe are good illustrations for this per se approach, or now I'll call it justificatory, 148 and 150. But I would like at the end just to cite paragraph 149, which I think is even better uh, evidence of that approach, which is either per se or justificatory. And they say this, that sound financial management and those financial interests are liable to be seriously compromised by breaches of the principles of the rule of law committed in a member state, since those breaches may result in there being no guarantee uh, that expenditure by the union budget satisfies all uh, the financing conditions laid down by the uh, EU law and therefore meets the objectives, etc. So what basically in this rather badly drafted sentence the court tells us is that in itself uh, those the, the, the absence of effective judicial review must have effective, must have effect upon the budget. And, and so I insist, there is a certain mismatch there. There is a certain tension within the, within the judgment. And I, for one, would much prefer emphasis on the former, on the per se or justificatory approach, rather than this insistence on very high threshold of evidence that you must show that a particular breach of the rule of law leads to mismanagement of the budget. Thank you very much. Professor Alemano, a reaction to the questions or response to the questions from the audience? Well, I couldn't hear very well, but I, I think there was a comment by Manuele regarding what I've been saying, which might have appeared harsh vis-a-vis -vis the role played by Germany was a contextual consideration based on a lot of political science literature that over the years it shows basically how uh, Germany actually played a role in, in appeasing uh, a variety of actors, both within and outside mm. of the European Union. So I don't think I've been saying something too controversial, but it's something which is also based on pretty solid research led by a variety of political science. I think uh, the legacy of Angela Merkel is, is there and it will become a bit more apparent in the coming hours and days. So this is, uh, okay. it probably will be more visible. Uh, to, to all of us, also those inside the institutions. Thank you very much, Professor Closer. So, so thank you. Um, very quickly for the three questions I have uh, for Emmanuel Repasti. Um, I, I think I, I'm asked about OIA first because I always try to say the Polish government, the Hungarian government, and perhaps I mentioned Poland, Hungary, and Hungary. So it's not my intention to make a whole. I, I always try to speak about governments, and if you see my writing, I never mentioned countries that are mentioned governments. But anyway, so your, your first question that introduces a positive uh, hindsight on my very negative or very pessimistic view, I, I agree with you that the involving civil society as triggers of enforcement mechanisms is a very positive thing. Nevertheless, it doesn't change the system because at the end, the entry points are both, or are two of them, commission or the court. There are no other entry points. And once we are again in those entry points, all the things I said about the behavior of those states versus those institutions apply. So if the commission is limited in this action because of political considerations, this is going to happen even if there are civil society actors pressing for commission action. I don't think that the governments will change dramatically in their pressure on the commission because there are civil actors, but I may be wrong. I think it's positive to enlarge the number of possible triggers of actors that can be activating those kind of mechanisms. But I don't think it's going to change dramatically the system. So it's a kind of very ambiguous response to you. So one thing is positive, in one hand is positive. On the other hand, I don't think it's a huge change of the of the system. Now, um, for Julio, that's a very technical discussion. I think in Hitchman, uh, Hitchman theory, voice comprises everything from zero to infinite, right? So B2 will be the string point of voice. And what you're saying, that something has to be elaborated. And I will have to think about that this way when you reach the position of B2, voice becomes something different. And you may be right on that, but I, 
I haven't thought and I could give you a final answer for that. I, I tend to stick with the more traditional view of excess voice and, and loyalty, but it's good to think about. And then for uh, Ramona, about my uh, science fiction uh, proposal, it is true. It's science fiction, but I think it's important to, to talk about what is unthinkable because that creates additional pressure and goes in the same direction of having civil society involved. Uh, the more you talk about possibilities like that, the more you increase the pressure of, of, uh, for those actors who are not complying with European Union law. And in a way, this kind of mechanism fulfill the deterrence components in nuclear doctrine, that now we're speaking so much about that. Nuclear doctrine is not about using missiles. Nuclear doctrine is about the threat of using. And, and Putin has learned this very cleverly. He says, I can use them. It's not that he's using it. I can use them. And that models the behavior of others. So you can threaten with a spell expulsion, that may have some kind of uh, effect on the behavior of those who are not complying with the law. But then if you push me, I would say that in a extreme situation, I could imagine that the European Union member states would be prepared to do something about that. They did with the fiscal compact. You know, and you may say, okay, the fiscal compact was a small thing. Well, it was a small thing, but it involved the, the <coughs> reform of the national constitutions. It involved uh, bringing some new institutions, which are particularly powerful within the European, like the Eurogroup. And it, it also involved uh, sanctioning some kind of mechanisms that were also in the sixth path, but are much more stronger in the, in the stability and uh, in the fiscal compact. And hey, not all members of the European Union were part of the fiscal compact, right? So what I'm saying is, it's a very extreme proposal, and I understand it's science fiction, but think of it. You can really empty up the European Union and create a, something next to the European Union in which those countries who are offending the rule of law value are not members. Mm. Okay. It's a very radical proposal, I know, science fiction, but there are ways to do that. Can I yes, please. come back on, on a couple of issues? Uh, uh, very briefly, for uh, uh, Wojciech, uh, maybe we can have some common ground in the following distinction. When it comes to show effects on the union budget and impact, you need to provide hard evidence of those impacts. When it comes to show uh, a risk for the union budget, then we follow a justificatory or inference approach. Because you cannot, and the court says, the, the section on risk is very interesting. The court says, you don't need to prove it. How can you prove a risk? You need to show it, and you need to show it through inference. And, and there, I think, we can find some common understanding. Um, uh, on Carlos, I think that now, perhaps, the conditions of possibility to start thinking about treaty change and positive treaty change may exist again. Maybe not among all the member states. Maybe the conditions of possibility mm -hmm. for thinking about how to change the treaty change rules yeah. are there now, thanks to Mr. Putin. <laughs> <laughs> and, and maybe just because our, thank you very much, Julio, uh, our audience uh, has followed with patience this debate. We have received a question in the chat, so uh, I will ask uh, the panelists uh, to react to that. And the question is about the strategy of the European Commission, which now I uh, read from the from the chat box, continues to continue to not apply the rule of law conditionality mechanism to not interfere in the Hungarian elections and in a broader context in general prepare well and slowly the first cases and to probably uh, green light the, uh, the funds for Poland in the view of the war. Do you feel that this is a good approach? This is the question addressed to all the members of the panel. Considering that time has already passed in the rule of law crisis, would you privilege an approach that favorizes a more swift, swift reaction? So the question is more about the Hungarian elections, which comes from Frederick Bo. Mm. Well, I... I have written, as you know, on the Commission and this strategy of enforcement, and uh, I, I, I have, I have a mixed, uh, mixed feeling about that because I would say that you take it from a kind of uh, moral approach and uh, demanding approach. You, you may understand that there are uh, quite a few criticisms that can be labeled against the Commission in action. Uh, things can be said, but on the other hand, if you think about the whole system, you say, okay. The objective of any action, of any enforcement action, of any sanction, would be obtaining compliance. It's not really punishment by itself, right? 
So what I think equates very much in, in this calculation, but I'm not sure, uh, perhaps people that knows better how the, the institutions take this kind of decision can correct me, but I think what weights very much in the approach of the Commission is even if you impose sanctions, and those sanctions, or you will withdraw the funds. Measures. Yeah, even if you, <laughs> if you, if you, if you impose, uh, if you impose whatever, withdraw all of the funds or sanctions, those do not work, what will be the result? If you don't extract compliance from those who are errant in rule of law situations, having imposed sanctions, what else? What is left? What is left is a little bit of an erosion of the credibility of the Commission as a strong enforcer. That would be one of the results because everybody will say, hey, there is a government that even under a situation uh, with measures of sanctions is defying the authority of the Commission and is unable, the Commission is unable to obtain compliance. So I think this kind of calculation weighs very heavily in the Commission, but I may be wrong. Uh, perhaps there are other factors there that are political factors and other questions that are there. And there is also an additional element that has to be considered that sanctions normally trigger in some cases what is called a rant around, rally around the flag effect. But you punish a, a government, and even if the population considers that government to be illegitimate, a, there is a reaction against external interference, and you rally to support the government. We have seen that, if you remember, in the 60s in, in Spain with Franco, a highly legitimate uh, regime was sanctioned by the United Nations, and the whole population kind of rallied to support the authoritarian regime, which is it is crazy uh, if you think about that. So, again, this kind of collision could be in the mind of the of the Commission, right? Maybe just to complete, uh, not just the credibility of the Commission, because the measure will go to court, the court will make uh, a judgment, and then will be the credibility of all the government. <coughs> Thank you, Emmanuel Rebast, Professor Sadowski. Yes, yeah, so going back to the question by Frederick Borg, uh, in this most scholarly of all the academic fora that is on Twitter, I have, coined, <laughs> I have coined a new concept or a new ideology, which is not nowism. And that consists of saying not now, that there are some periods when we should suspend insistence on the rules. I had already mentioned about not now in Poland because of the war. Now in Hungary, as Frederick refers to, there is another not now because of the elections. I would say, and here I go back to the famous classical article by Stephen Holmes on rule compliance. It is precisely in moments some, such as this, when the temptation to breach the rules is the highest, that we should insist on the rules. And, you know, precisely in the time of war, we may expect that the bad guys would try to very quickly, under the guise of the war, push through further mischief, as they have been actually doing it. And precisely in the time of elections, we have to remind people like Orban and his people about the uh, duty to obey the law. Uh, so, so no, I, I agree, I think, with the sentiment expressed in this question that I believe that that, that, that the action, obviously, by the Commission should be much swifter. Thank you very much. And uh, first, the last reaction before uh, concluding the panel from okay. Professor Peter Oliver. I'll be the last. Um, I'm fully agree with what everyone said, except I'm not going to do that. Well, that's not the only thing I'm going to say. Except I'm not because the election is only a couple of weeks away. And if uh, Auburn loses the elections. Well, we wouldn't want any sanctions to be imposed, at least, or oh, sorry, any yes. measures to be taken. Any measures to be taken. Restricting um, I'm restricting measures. I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning. I'm learning. I'm learning. Uh, at least not for some time to see how the new government behaves. And if uh, Auburn is re elected, then I would think that um, uh, restricting measures should be taken very, very quickly. But I think Hungary, we've got to think of Hungary separately because of that. Julio Baquero, I said, okay. Oh, yeah, this was the last yes, one. No, oh, sorry, sorry. Yes, please, please. No, I cannot say on Hungary no, because no, no. I'm, I'm, yes. I'm bound by, by duty of the voir de reserve, as I am involved in, 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 in some of these uh, issues. But what I can say is that 
the, the regulation has never been applied yet, and, and we don't know what it will trigger. What we know is what has been done and not done so far, mm -hmm. and we do know what what consequence it had. Uh, none. Uh, so, I mean, uh, this, this is a, we have imperfect alternatives, and, and, and of course, one needs to weigh the pros and cons. Eh? But uh, we know what has been achieved mm. so far. Well, this being said, it is unfair from the ones who are following uh, online. We will have a drink now and time to discuss all the remaining questions. <laughs> it is a pity that Professor Sadurski, Professor Alemano, Professor Zauger, you cannot be with us. And also the audience, we hope to have other debates and to meet in person here at the Institute for European Studies. It has been a very rich discussion and uh, it shows that there is still room for debate on the questions that we have tried to address all together. We promised with Julio Baquero Cruz an interdisciplinary discussion and I think uh, we managed to have both legal and political science perspectives uh, to understand the rulings of the Court of Justice. So on behalf of the Institute, it remains me to thank you very, very much the members of the two panel for the contribution to this debate, also the audience. And the team of the Institute, Maria Isabel Sol de Lila and Olga Minampala, for the great help in the organization of this event. This said, uh, thank you very much. Have a very nice evening, and I hope to see you soon for our next debates and discussions at the Institute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.